Assalamu alaikum, hello and welcome to The Health Show here only on the Islam Channel with me, Alistair Greener. As you're aware, The Health Show tackles everyday health concerns. Joined by health experts within their specialised field, we discuss the prevention of these concerns by offering an alternative viewpoint for our viewers watching at home. Now, if you'd like any further information on today's show or any of the topics that we discuss, please do get in touch at healthshow at islamchannel.tv. Now, today we're delighted to be able to welcome Ali Orhan from Cancer Equality, part of Ethnic Minority Cancer Awareness Month. We've invited him to discuss the campaign which raises an awareness to the cancer within BAME communities. The campaign is also addressing various cultural myths and taboos that can have a negative impact on those affected by cancer. Ali has extensive knowledge and experience gained from working with numerous cancer charities. He's here to showcase the work he does and how he hopes the campaign can tackle the stigma associated with cancer in certain communities. So Ali, thank you very much indeed for coming in. Thank you. It's a really important topic, so I'm looking forward to getting stuck in and finding out more about what you do. But first of all, as part of this year's campaign, Cancer Equality has produced an advert to help the challenge the various cultural myths and taboos that exist in some communities. Cancer means more than having a life-changing disease. For some people, it can lead to blame, shame, fear, rejection, isolation and judgment. The message the campaign hopes to portray is to make a stand and support the millions who live with cancer, because together we can make things better. It's by sharing this advert amongst the community and also healthcare professionals that they aim to help stop the stigma faced by those affected by cancer. Let's take a look at the advert. We all have secrets. Sometimes, that secret is cancer. For some of us, cancer means blame and shame. For some of us, cancer means being too afraid to tell our family. For some of us, cancer means keeping it from our friends because they don't want to talk about that sort of thing. For some of us, cancer means not speaking to a doctor because of what others may say. For some, cancer means being feared and misunderstood. It means being less likely to marry or start a family. It means being judged by class or status. It means being isolated by myth and superstition. For some of us, cancer means being on the fringes of our community, alone and ashamed. But here's the thing, cancer can affect anyone, anywhere. We all have secrets. What isn't a secret is by 2020, an estimated 3 million people will be living with cancer throughout the UK. People in our schools and our universities, people in our churches, our mosques and temples, people in our workplaces, our high streets, and our supermarkets. Because the truth is, most of us will know someone with cancer. No one ever deserves cancer, and nobody should be embarrassed by it or punished for it. Let's set aside the fear and the fault, because cancer doesn't have to mean blame or shame. Cancer doesn't have to mean guilt or loneliness. Instead, let it mean encouragement and understanding. Let it stand for empathy and compassion. Let us support the millions who live with cancer every day and who prosper and succeed in spite of it. Because together, we can make things better. Give support, ask for help, start the conversation now and stop the shame forever. So Ali, that was an incredibly powerful film and 
absolutely shows how most of us will know somebody who's affected by this terrible disease. What inspired the production of that particular video? How did it come into being? We wanted to do something quite hard hitting. We wanted to make sure that we were able to kind of showcase something that was going to get people to stop and think uh, because it's something that we just can't skirt around. It's something that we need to tackle head on. We need to kind of um, showcase, uh, but more importantly, hold accountable the communities that do have those particular viewpoints or these kind of uh, ways of thinking uh, that, in, that in, by doing so alienate those that are at greatest risk and those that, who are ill. The interesting thing is that we have seen a greater awareness of cancer. You know, there was a time, wasn't there, when it would be called the C word because people were so afraid of it. A lot of progress has been made, but I'm guessing the reason for having this campaign is, in your view, not enough progress has been made. Definitely, that's the case. I mean, we, we all, and rightly so, we've seen many campaigns um, mainstream that have kind of showcased um, campaigns adverts, uh, resources, publications, but very little has been specifically targeted at the BAME community. Um, and yes, the, 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 the C word is still frowned upon within certain communities within the BAME community. Um, the, the mere utter of the word, uh, by even mentioning the word, is, is this, there is a viewpoint that it might come to your doorstep. You might be inviting it in. So people just even, you know, my own mother herself will refer to the condition as that bad illness. She won't even use the word cancer. Um, and that's someone that's kind of been here for nearly 40 years, uh, but still has his fear that it's such a bad illness that, you know, just the mere words, uttering those words, will, you know, will encourage the, the illness into the family. And how did the whole charity come about in the first place of Cancer Equality? What, what inspired its inception? Well, Cancer Equality, kind of, um, in 1999, a group of us got together uh, that we could see the kind of the, the, the marketplace out there in the cancer field was changing. Uh, resources were being stretched uh, and fewer and fewer uh, campaigns or services were being targeted at BAME communities. So we um, got together to kind of look at how we might be able to address that and hold account some of the big charities and, um, and organisations working in the field of cancer to be able to ensure that they don't, didn't forget about BAME communities when they were creating new services or developing resources. Um, so, and within a few years later, we became a registered charity. Uh, there's, a, there's seven of us in total. Uh, we don't have any paid staff. Uh, we're all volunteers uh, made up of various specialisms and expertise in the field of um, uh, cancer, health promotion, diet, um, uh, health and care as well. I was going to say, what, what is it specifically that you do that's different from other cancer charities? Obviously, you're targeting the, um, the BAME community and their, um, their awareness and you know, the, how they're affected by cancer. But what exactly do you do? We try and hold account some of the big charities uh, and the organisations that work in the field of cancer to ensure that they don't forget there is another demographic. There was another population group that aren't mainstream. And what uh, is it about that community that needs highlighting, if you like? Um, I, I think, like most BAME communities, um, if you've not been exposed to information, awareness, your, uh, your levels of knowledge are going to be less. You're starting from a much uh, kind of baseline uh, as opposed to something a few uh, advanced. So trying to bring things back to a level that's understandable, that's both delivered in a culturally and ling culturally linguistically appropriate manner that people buy into, um, that, that, that don't fear. Um, you know, we, we tend to kind of we take for granted, some, you know, some people we talk about various cancers, but if you don't have the language, how can you ask the questions? How do we in talk about a particular cancer if individuals don't even actually know that cancer exists or where it's from or what, what forms it or what the conditions or the, or the side effects are? So it's, it's, it's a whole multitude of, of, of concerns. How much does it vary uh, across the UK, the level of knowledge and understanding of the BAME community? Because 
many of us would assume that actually in an area where there is a high proportion of the BAME community, that actually that knowledge would be there and that understanding would be there already. Mm, I'd like to think that was the case. Um, we still, places even like London, you didn't, where we were very diverse and very mixed uh, in, in the makeup of, of different type of communities, um, we still see communities that kind of come through to, to cancer equality with the same issues of those living in Bradford, for example, or Manchester or Leeds. Um, they, you know, and, and the main concern is a lack of awareness. That's the one, one thing that kind of comes through loud and clear. Um, they just didn't know that this condition existed. They didn't know they could possibly get it. And more, and more importantly, what to do next. Because um, if, you, if you don't have the awareness and, and the language, going to a GP, and not knowing what to ask for, or what to actually disclose, or what symptoms to kind of relay to the GP, makes the GP's job really difficult. So, um, and of course, if your language, if English isn't your first language, you then might, might be reliant on bringing your ch a child with you uh, to translate for you. And that's not always appropriate, because um, most people don't want to disclose their, something personal about themselves, especially to their child. If anything, they want to protect them and not kind of frighten them or, or, or give them concern. Um, so we, we see this constant um, issue of coming up where people just don't know, you know, this dismay of what to do. And why do you think that is so prevalent within the BAME community, this lack of awareness, this lack of knowledge? Well, I think there's a failing on by organisations uh, and um, government to be able to prioritise this particular demographic as a, a, an area of concern. Um, if, you, if you do run these population ap approach campaigns and assume that it will hit everyone and everyone will get the same message in the same way and will respond accordingly, then we know that's not going to that's going to fail. We know you need to have targeted campaigns with specific kind of um, pulls and attractions that are, people are going to relate to. They're going to see themselves in that campaign and want to listen, want to acknowledge and want to take part. Now, your, your campaign has a two-pronged approach. On one hand, you're looking at, as you said, the major charities yeah. to make sure that they have a greater understanding and greater awareness of the BAME community, but also you're doing a lot of work within the BAME community themselves to help them understand better. Give us an idea, apart from the campaign we've just seen, of some of the things that you've been doing to increase that awareness on both fronts. Well, the, the Ethnic Minority Cancer Awareness Month was was just was set up by the charity to actually show, um, to highlight this concern at least once a year. So for a, uh, you know, a set time during the month of, uh, of July, um, we, we encouraged charities to kind of, just for that month alone, to prioritise a particular community and to make their resources or their messaging focused. Um, in the past, we've also run, uh, provided small grants for organisations, be it BAME organisations, to apply. Um, only a tokenistic amount of money, um, as I said, we're a small charity, but it enabled groups to, um, to set up a small um, kind of awareness talk or a presentation, invite the local health, um, kind of cancer charity or their specialist um, doctor or consultant to come along and give a talk to that, to that particular community. And they worked really well. We, we, we funded um, a number of uh, groups up and down the country during the month. Uh, for, for a number of years. And it's interesting when you say talking to the community because uh, it, there's a huge amount of work to be done there. Why do you think the community itself has such little awareness sometimes? Um, that's, a, that's a tricky one because if you've not been told, how do you know? If someone's not actually given you the information, how can you find out? Um, when you have a number of other social issues in your life, and we know for a number of BAME communities, the issues of discrimination, poor housing, ill health, other health conditions, um, you know, become paramount. If you've had several strikes against you, cancer becomes the least important because you need to have you know, you need to address kind of unemployment. You need food on the table. You need you need housing. You know, those are the things that kind of 
people focus on and health has, takes a back seat, unfortunately, until its crisis point. And we know a lot of admissions and pick, where conditions like cancer are picked up are usually through uh, admissions into A&E, where someone has kind of literally collapsed and have been rushed in, and at that point is where investigations take place and diagnosis takes ha happens. And, and that's the big thing we know about cancers. It's all about detection at an early stage. And I can imagine that this is a major issue. If people aren't even confronting the possibility that cancer might exist, that actually the detection rates are often too late. Yeah, that, and, yeah and we see that, and it, and it is very high within BAME communities, uh, that whole issue. Trying to get BAME communities to be proactive, um, and I've run various campaigns, health campaigns, not just around cancer, but other health conditions as well, um, where we know the prevalence of high blood pressure or diabetes can be high in certain community groups. But even knowing the facts, people tend not to make those adjustments in their, to their lifestyles about physical activity or healthy eating because, you know, life. <laughs> well, one of the things we've discovered, you know, during the three series we've now done yeah. on The Health Show is sometimes, you know, there's a reluctance predominantly for men to go and seek medical advice. And certainly within the BAME community, there seems to be sometimes a reluctance to go and seek help from the professionals. What can we do to encourage people to actually face up to something that might not be quite right and go early to see the health professionals? Um, that, again, and, and I'm glad you raised the whole issue of men. I think men's health is very much underrated. Um, you, you know, I, I, you know, as men, we don't necessarily have those investigative kind of treatments as we get older, uh, unlike women with, with childbirth and what have you. So um, it's like a badge of honour to say, I've not seen my GP in 10 years, and to think that's OK. Um, so when you get your kind of your, your MOT check from your GP, your doctor to come in and have your cholesterol and your glucose levels checked, uh, that you don't go because there's nothing wrong with me. You know, I'm a man, um, illness is a sign of weakness and I don't want to be seen as weak. Um, and they ignore things. Or sometimes practicality doesn't allow you. You know, you do long hours at work, you know, you can't take the time off. Um, waiting times to see your GP can be weak sometimes. People just ignore. Um, so, you know, it, it's, I always find women, mothers, wives, partners are a good um, um, catalyst to get men to kind of be proactive. It's usually kind of the, the wives that usually ring the GP and make the appointment and say, I've made the appointment, you're going on this day. Um, it's, it, it, is a, it is a tough one, and I'm, I'm interested to know how your campaign has been received by the community themselves, because obviously there's a huge amount of work to be done with the charities themselves so that they are more receptive, more responsive, and more aware of the issues within the BAME community. But how do the BAME community themselves feel about this you know, cancer equality campaign? Um, we, we had our reservations when we, when we put the campaign together. We thought, um, is this going to show the community in a negative light? And that was never our intention. Our intention was to ensure that we empowered the community to be able to uh, face up to some of the issues that we were, were addressing within the campaign uh, and, and for them to, to be open to actually talk about the issue and, and that be a starting point. I mean, to date, we've had over 49,000 views to, uh, onto the video, um, and that's, that exceeds our expectations. We never thought for a second we would get that many. Um, and of those 49, I think I've only read one comment which questioned why we were doing this specifically aimed at BAME communities and not general communities. So I think, you know, and, I, and our BAME communities are, can be quite vocal when they need to. And I think if they were unhappy about this, they would have, they, they would have come forward and shown their, uh, their disappointment. It's always interesting to hear, you know, the need for such a charity as yours. Yeah. 
Of course, we talked earlier on about progress being made. Give us an indication how effective your campaign has been. Maybe some stories where actually you've been able to really make a difference. We've some of the, the, the anecdotal stuff that we've picked up and, and the comments that we've received from um, the views and, and the general circulation is that um, we had one particular woman who came who, who contacted us to say that she had never seen a campaign that was so honest. It kind of made her, it empowered her to be able to confront some of the issues, uh, not just with her immediate family, but with her extended community as well. Um, and so that's kind of, that's a really powerful thing to be able to kind of feel that you, there's a tool there that you can kind of show to others and say, we need to address this. This can't ca continue. Um, we've heard one woman who has come forward and said, I've not been able to marry because I ha I've had cancer and because the, the, there's a strong possibility I won't be able to have children. Um, I've not been able to find a husband that would want to marry someone that was, isn't able to have a child. Um, and she said, having seen the campaign, it doesn't bother me now. It's okay that I'm not married. Because these issues are far more important, um, you know, in with it for myself more so than just trying to conform to what the community wants me to do. Brilliant. Just really quickly before we go to break, what would you like our viewers to do as a result of now being aware of this campaign? What would you like them to do? Enter into talks. You know, don't be afraid to discuss the topic of cancer. Um, let's not kind of shun those that have been affected by cancer. Um, there's no, there is no blame. There is no shame associated with, with, with this condition. Uh, let's not feel that just because, because a family member has had it, that whole family themselves will go on to have it, and therefore they should not be mixed with. Brilliant. Some great, great advice. We've got lots more to talk yeah. about in the second half and a lot more of the work that you're doing, but for the moment, thank you very much. Uh, we will be back in a moment, but first of all, we should stress that should you suffer from any medical problems or health concerns, it's always highly recommended that you contact your doctor or GP, as the health show gives you an alternative viewpoint to the health concern being discussed. We'll be right back. See you after the break. Hello and welcome back to The Health Show, where today we are joined by Ali Orhan to discuss cancer equality. In 1999, experts in the field of cancer care, information and support came together to address the needs of black, Asian and minority ethnic communities and founded Cancer Equality. The driving force was the commitment to ensure that despite the closure of BAME specific cancer services, the knowledge, expertise and learning gained through these services should not be lost but built upon. South Africa's KwaZulu-Natal province is in the grip of a cancer crisis. Patient waiting times have reached more than a year in some cases. The government is trying to spend its way out of the problem, but that was too late for one family. This is the final resting place of Piwankosi in Kize. The retired electrician's death tells the story of the healthcare crisis in South Africa's KwaZulu-Natal province. In May 2017, the 66-year-old was diagnosed with stage 4 lung cancer. But because of overstretched oncology services, he was told to return for a scan 15 months later. Piwankosi said the pain was so unbearable that he attempted suicide. I'm very grateful to you for coming to hear my story. Maybe I'll now get help, because now the illness is too painful. I can't take it anymore. As his health worsened, his scan was brought forward, but it was too late for Piwan Korsi. He died less than 12 months after diagnosis without receiving any treatment, depressed and in pain. I do blame the Department of Health a lot because they, they, they do not take care of a patient who is suffering with cancer. Opposition lawmaker and Dr. Imran Kika championed Piwan Korsi's case while he was alive. Kika says at least 499 people have died in the province waiting for treatment between 2015 and 2016. Clearly this is a case of a government that violates citizens' humans, human rights. 
Human rights researchers found patients in the province's public hospitals typically wait 5 to 12 months to see an oncologist and another 8 months before starting radiotherapy. There are concerns, obviously. We would, we would all like to access services uh, uh, as soon as we find that there's something wrong with us. Uh, we need to reduce the, the times, but there are things that uh, we need to deal with. Durban's Addington Hospital announced in June that its oncology service is once again working at full capacity to address the situation. Officials have also promised to hire more health professionals in the province and the health minister said the region would get a share of a $7.6 million relief fund. But for Piwankosi's family and others like them, the steps are too little, too late. That's a particularly tragic story, but actually that isn't just happening in South Africa, that's happening all over the place where people's treatment just takes too long. What kind of help are you suggesting in those kind of circumstances to try and speed up the process? I mean, it's quite difficult because each trust has, a, has different kind of time scales and waiting times. Um, I mean, there are specific guidelines set by the government in regards to processing certain kind of um, cancers um, and treatment um, pathways. Um, but again, for BAME communities, it's that lack of awareness and understanding and knowledge as well. Um, you know, not complying to medication, not, you know, not understanding, uh, not attending hospital appointments. Um, you know, it, it and also we discussed before about coming forward in the very first place as soon as there's a slight indication. One of the things we talk about a lot about on this program is as soon as you see anything that's different about your body that's not quite the same over a, a period of time, then for goodness sake, seek help. Yeah, I mean, early detection is crucial. And then like in most cancers, if it's caught early, the prognosis is far better uh, and your treatment options are greater as well. Uh, but when it's left and it's um, advanced uh, and then spread, your, you know, your, your chances of recovery are, are, are less. It was interesting you said earlier on about, you know, many people from the BAME community, or not many, but, but some people from the community don't always attend health appointments, they don't always take their medication. What, why do you think that there's that reluctance? Why are they not, you know, participating to, you know, give themselves a better chance? I think sometimes it's just lack of just the, the awareness. Um, if, you've not, if it's not been explained to you, what you take, when you take it, and how you take it, how, how are you to know? Um, and if you're reliant on, you know, your children kind of prompting you, and that doesn't always happen, it's it just, you know, it's, we just need to be clearer in our instructions, you know, and, and, and give the support to get people to kind of comply and to, to follow um, medical treatment. So give us an example of that kind of clarity that you're seeking when it comes to explaining the importance of appointments, the importance of taking medication. Because many of us would take that for granted that, you know, the doctor tells us something, then we go ahead and do it. So mm -hmm. what is it in the communication that has to be slightly different to certain members of the community? I think it, it just needs to be spelt out. It needs to be, you know, broken down into sound bites that someone is able to understand, especially if ling their first language is in English, to be able to kind of have clear instructions on the actual packaging. Um, you know, whether it's colour coded or um, it's put into kind of doset boxes, so divided per, uh, per days to make it easier for people. Um, we know that with cancer, you know, the older you, you are, the greater your chance to become, of, of getting cancer increases. So therefore, with old age comes a number of other conditions, forgetfulness, you know, what have you. So prompts, um, clear instructions, just making it easy for them to be able to kind of know when to take the, the medication is vital. I can imagine one of the challenges for the health experts could be sometimes they don't want to come across as patronising, you know, spelling out too much if someone is actually quite able to understand what they're saying. Do you help in distinguishing when somebody is in need of that help versus somebody who actually is probably okay? <laughs> 
if sometimes there are just clear language issues and those have to be overcome by some kind of translation interpreting service that's kind of that's just standard um, what sometimes happen, happens is that when someone is diagnosed with a condition and they're given that prognosis there and then, you don't always absorb everything at that precise moment. I hear of men and women saying that they, everything fuzzes out. They just hear blur, the sound is always blurred. Um, they go into denial, shock, um, anger, and those can manifest in all kinds of ways in someone's behaviour uh, and actions. And that's interesting you say that because actually that's common for everybody, yeah, irrespective exactly. of their yes. background, that you know, the, the, the terrible moment that you get that mm -hmm. news and how you then deal with it from a professional's point of view. So it's not just, you know, this might be the third person no. today that you're having to it's give this news to. So it can become a little bit of a process. Are there any specific sort of ways of handling that for the BAME community that might be a little bit different to um, their other patients that professionals should be aware of? Again, language, ensuring that the kind of the information they've relayed has been understood. Um, I have men that I speak to who be, have been walking around for six months or so thinking they have prostate cancer. And it's not prostate cancer they have, they have an enlargement. But because they heard prostate, they automatically assume. So it, and and that, that is the negligence of the healthcare professional to ensure that the right information is given and backed up in writing as well. So they can then take away and digest at their le le leisure with family and friends if possible. One of the things I know that you do a lot of work, almost like a, as a pressure group, to make sure that the medical community has a greater understanding and awareness that we've talked about, and also the community themselves. But you also do quite a lot of advocacy work as well. Tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, we try and kind of get, you know, to, to be the voice of, 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 of service users that kind of have, have not received the right kind of, kind of service, that feel that they uh, have their, their, their needs haven't been kind of addressed in the, in the correct way. So we try and, you know, act as that link between the healthcare professional and the patient themselves. Um, and sometimes, and it's a two-way thing, because sometimes we have to relay back to the patient themselves that this is the format. This is the structure, this is the way things are done in this particular order and manner. Because um, sometimes if you're new to the country and you're unfamiliar with you know, waiting times and hospital appointments and departments, um, it's kind of alien to you. So we sometimes have to spell that out as well. How do you go about that, reaching out to, especially people who maybe have recently come to the country whose English is you know, very low at this stage, how do you reach out to those people? Because sometimes they might not just appear on the radar as such. Well, we get a number of referrals directly, and I think we have been around for a number of years, so most healthcare professionals will have heard of us or know of us uh, and are able to kind of contact us, and we then just contact the person directly. Or we just give them the advice to be able to then relate back to, back to them. Often people who do the work that you do mm. have really got into it through a personal story, through a, a personal series of events. Yeah. What motivated you to enter in this? Because I know you've been in the field of, of healthcare for, for many, many years. What is it that appealed to you to follow the path that you did? I think for me personally, uh, I lost a cousin uh, who was 18 years old to cancer. Uh, I was around seven at the time, and it kind of left this... Um, this void in my life that someone so young would die and not just someone but someone that was a relative a cousin someone that I kind of looked up to um, so I kind of felt when I grow up I want to do something about this um, and this was someone that was you know born and brought up in the UK but I could see the struggles that he was going through um, and his issue was not around around his culture but more to do with his age it was just not something that was seen all those years ago that someone young dying of cancer, it was just kind of unheard of. Um, yeah, so that kind of left, left a kind of definitely a, a, a mark on, in, 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 my, in my psyche about as to what to do next. And it's often those landmark moments that can have that impact on our lives. 
And going to the other extreme now, what about the future in terms of the campaign? You know, we talked a lot about how things are improving, but there's still a real need for a charity like yours. Where do you see your work taking you? We'd like to continue what we're doing. We'd like to kind of produce more resources uh, that are in community languages that kind of meet the new new communities that are arriving now. I mean, we never, we, you know, 10, 15 years ago, we would never have thought about producing a resource in Polish. But we know now that they make up a big number of the, um, the population in the UK. Um, so we'll definitely look in, into that. We're doing more work with um, the Irish community, which kind of in itself are not necessarily identified as a BAME, uh, but they are. They're still a minority group within, uh, within the UK. Um, and they have cultural um, specific needs, not necessarily language needs, but cultural needs uh, that we try and work with. Um, the the travelling community uh, as well. So there are lots of subgroups as well that we work with. And that must be very interesting for you to try and understand the nuances of all of these subgroups as you refer to them, because they are so different. You know, Britain has a very proud heritage of, of its multiculturalism and so many different groups. How do you get to understand all of those different nuances? Because even from a, particularly, a particular ethnic group, there are many Some, differences yeah. within those groups. I think what makes us unique is that we listen. We have the time, capacity and capability to actually listen firsthand to the needs of individuals and see them as an individual and not pigeonhole them into a certain group or a subgroup. Um, and then create something that's going to be unique to them. And what are some of the trends that you're seeing? You know, we, we've seen, you know, a, a massive rise in people coming from many different backgrounds to Britain. And, you know, the people who may be here for generations already, how they're changing. What are some of the trends that you're seeing in your work? Um, I, I, some of the kind of the, the issues that are that we, we, we would have hoped that would have changed by now with second, third generation, um, we still find, you know, that those issues around secrecy, those issues around affecting confidentiality, and a number of things that kind of prevent BAME communities from coming forward, uh, is that whole thing, the issue of what will they do with this information? Where will it be stored? How will it impact on me, first and foremost, but how will it impact on my children and my family in the future? So, um, and because it's the unknown, uh, where that data is going to be captured, where it's going to go, how it's going to be used against them. You know, um, they, they just withhold that information. Two words that I really want to talk about a little bit more because it seems something that you've, you've, you've mentioned quite a few times when it comes to the BAME community, and that's of blame and shame. You know, very much a part of what you stand for. How does that manifest itself within the BAME community that is an obstruction to them getting the help that they need? Well, there are various cultural dictates sometimes that kind of um, create that, that, that shame and blame um, issue. Um, we know that there are, in some cases, in some communities, there is, this, there is this mindset that in a previous life, or even in this life, I myself or someone associated with me has done something bad and as a result I've gone on to get cancer. There is that kind of that, that belief that it's an action because of your action. Uh, there are those that also believe that um, it's, it's an act of God and therefore this kind of sense that it's just your kismet. This is what your fate is, this is what's been prescribed for you, just embrace it. It's quite a fatalistic approach. Um, and there are some groups that kind of believe in that and accept it and live accordingly. Um, we have some faith groups that believe in the divine intervention. And I've heard pastors um, and spiritual leaders and guiders um, get cancer patients to stop taking their medication because that's not going to help, apparently. If you pray, then you know, you'll be cleared of this illness. And again, we know um, praying in it on, it on its own isn't necessarily just the, is the cure. 
that must be very difficult to overcome because at the end of the day, you know, you've got almost faith versus science in that respect. How do you tread that very fine line? Uh, in no way do we dismiss someone's faith. I, th I think for a number of people with cancer, faith is the one thing that keeps them going. Um, and it's, it's the one hook they can ha hang on to um, in, that, in that time of desperation and need. So by no means do we discourage faith. Um, but we also encourage medicine and treatment. Um, and again, it's a very personal, personal choice for individuals. Um, I think as long as you're able to make an informed choice based on all the facts and figures, um, the decision is yours. And looking at the other side, you know, there are conditions, as you've highlighted there, which are more prevalent within the BAME community. And that's really important for the medical community to understand as well, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, and, and, and I think from, for those conditions, that most of the medical profession are aware of that, or they should be. So, you know, when a, a carib person of African Caribbean descent comes to their, G their GP, they should automatically get a blood pressure check. We know that you're at greater risk of having high blood pressure if you're, you're black African or black Caribbean. So that should be done as a given. Um, does it happen all the time? I think with, with time constraints on GPs and practice nurses, I think it gets missed out sometimes. Um, but if you're aware, you can then insist on that as well. Just to really wrap up here, I want to have really two final messages from the perspective of your charity of cancer equality. First of all, to the medical community. What would your message be to the medical community? I'd like the medical community to prioritise um, their services or their delivery to diverse communities, um, to, to, to change the ethos and the thinking of how they deliver uh, in a standard format, that it can be adapted given the restraints that are, that are posed on them, but people aren't excluded just because of their ethnicity around healthcare. And then to the BAME community themselves, what would you say to them? Let this be a wake up call. It's about if we're expecting healthcare professionals to deliver appropriate service to us, we in turn need to be proactive in prioritising our health and wellbeing. You've got your Cancer Awareness, Equal Cancer Awareness Month. You've got a lot of other campaigns. What's, what's next before, say, next year's <laughs> next monthly year. campaign? We haven't started thinking about next year's <laughs> campaign yet, but um, doing more of what we're doing, this campaign um, showed us that we can deliver a national campaign using um, kind of an online presence and, and have that many hits. So hopefully maybe something similar. Brilliant. It's fantastic what you do and, you know, awareness is always key on whatever subject we're talking about. So thank you for raising our awareness with this. It's been absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, that is all time we have for. So I'd like to thank our guest today, Ali Orhan from Cancer Equality. And also uh, just to let you know that once again, we must stress that should you suffer from any medical problems or health concerns, it's always highly recommended that you contact your doctor or GP as the health show gives you an alternative viewpoint to the health concern being discussed. If you'd like to find out more about this or any of the subjects we've discussed on the show, please do email us at healthshow at islamchannel.tv. Again, that's healthshow at islamchannel.tv. But from now, it's goodbye from me. Thank you again to our guests. Thank you for watching. See you next week. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much.